Hello, thank you for joining in. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to overcome rejection. And for anybody that follows me much at all, you know I usually address things in the natural and in the spiritual because I think the two go hand in hand. Um, what's going on in the natural is gonna have some type of spiritual element and what's going on in the spiritual is gonna have some type of natural element. So I always address both areas. And what I mean by that, like natural, the things we can hear, hear see, feel, experiences, situations, and those types of things. Supernatural is God, well, supernatural, spiritual, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, angels, and demons. So I'm gonna be talking about both. First, I'm gonna talk about root causes of rejection there are many and i'm not going to hit every single one of them so i'm going to just hit a few of them some could be negative words that are spoken over us how many of us know words have power and they can be very painful so spoken words that someone has said to us that we've overheard them say that they've directed at us at us that can cause rejection attitudes of others toward us sometimes people don't have to say a word it's a look they gave give us Roll, even rolling the eyes, you know, people can look at us and every word that comes out of our mouth, they roll our eyes and that can cause us to have rejection. Another one is being left out or overlooked. This could happen in your family. It could happen at work, at school, in the church. Like you're just always overlooked. You're never the one picked. How many of us have nightmares, not literally, well, maybe literally, but nightmares about being in school and the, the, what do they call that? Um, is it playground pick? I can't remember exactly what they call that, but you know where everybody lines up and the kids pick someone to be on their team and then another captain picks someone to be on their team. How many of us were the last to be picked? I was the last. I was not athletic at all. I was very shy and I was very quiet and I dreaded those picks because I knew nobody wanted me on their team. I was going to be one of the last ones and that's so embarrassing. It's so humiliating. I can also remember being in school when we had in gymnastics when we had to have all eyes on us and we had to climb that stupid pole. How many of y'all had to climb that pole? Oh my goodness. I couldn't even get off the ground and that was so humiliating. And it was so, ugh. so I, I definitely know that being overlooked at school in life can definitely cause rejection. So now I want to get a little bit more specific. So one, our parents and our home of origin. So like the family we were born into. One could be a lack of love. That could either be perceived or real. Even if you perceived your parents did not love you or they were not a fun affectionate, they did not show love, even if they felt it but you didn't perceive it, that can cause rejection. Parents who did not have the ability to show love. It may not even have been that they didn't love you, but they may have just been harsh, they may have had their own issues, they may have been fighting their own battles, and they just did not show love. Another one is not wanted by your parents rejected an unwanted pregnancy, like a, a mother or a father who just did not want your birth. You may not even know that they didn't want your birth, but you could have a spirit of rejection attached to you because when you were conceived, you were not wanted. Divorce is another area that can cause rejection. When one parent leaves the other, that can cause a disruption in your visitation. You may not see the other parent often. You may feel like they don't love you, they don't care about you, and they're just gone out of your life. Another one is lack. So that could look like lack in shelter. Maybe growing up, you guys didn't have a good stable home. You just didn't have the things that the other kids at school had. You didn't have enough food. You didn't have enough clothing. Not having the same clothing as the kids in school, can, other kids in school can also bring rejection. It can bring ridicule, it can bring humiliation. It can make you feel different, like you stand apart. You're not part of the group, you're not part of the team. Feeling like you're a burden on the family. For whatever reason, if it was because of monetary issues or because of emotional issues, if you had some personality stuff with you that just made you feel like you were a burden and that you couldn't be loved for who you were because you always brought hardship or you brought too much or you had too much baggage or you caused too many issues. Another one is if you had parents with physical or mental illness, that can majorly create rejection. If you have a parent who had, 
you know, disabilities to where they couldn't really interact in your life. They couldn't take you to school. They couldn't go on the outings or they had to work all the time or they just weren't available emotionally or physically. Another one is adoption. If you are adopted, even if you love the home you're in and you love the family you're with, that can still create a deep root of rejection. There are different levels of rejection. Some are, I mean, we're rejected all the time. We are not gonna be accepted by everybody. We all deal with different levels of rejection, but I'm talking about right now the deep roots of rejection. You may feel like you love the family you're with, you may be grateful for them, but there could be a deep root of rejection because your biological parents um, didn't keep you. Another one is if your sibling was favored, and this could be even perceived or real. Maybe in your eyes you just felt like that your sibling was loved more than you or that they were favored by your parents or they got better grades and they did better they was going to be more their life is more together however that works or it could really be in real life your parents did favor them they did gravitate towards them more they had more friends they did do better in those types of things another one is being ridiculed or shamed in your home of origin if you have parents who were very harsh and they ridiculed you, they shamed you, they give, gave you guilt, nothing you did was right, that can really form uh, rejection. Another one is harsh parenting. If they were just harsh, if they were very punitive, if they were not as loving and kind and generous, but they were just very harsh and very strict. So another area is being rejected by your peers. This could be at any age. This could be as you were a child, as you were growing up. This could be today. If you felt yourself as being different, and again, this could be perceived or it could be real. Maybe, maybe you do stand out. Maybe things are different and that's okay. But it doesn't matter as far as with the root of rejection, if it's real or if it's perceived. Maybe you never get picked for anything. Maybe you didn't have very many friends. Being bullied or made fun of especially as a young child, excuse me. You guys, I'm sorry, I'm dealing with a sinus infection. So my nose is bothering me. You will be seeing me take a lot of drinks because I'm dealing with some of this stuff. <clears throat> so being bullied or made fun of. Another one, like we already talked about, was being left out. So I'm not gonna go into further on that. Next is the workplace. How many knows we can get rejected in the workplace? We can be passed over for promotion. We know we deserve it. We should have it, but we get passed over for it every single time. We never get that promotion. We don't fit in with our coworkers. We're never asked out to lunch with the other people. We're talked about and gossiped about, bullied, ridiculed, or shamed. So that right there can lead to a root of rejection. If that is happening in your life, that can lead to you feeling very, very rejected, outside of the group, set apart, not in a good way, but feeling like you just never can fit in. And if you guys have questions, please feel free to type them out and at the end I will answer them. So another area that we can, that can create roots of rejection is the church. If you're left out of the cliques, if you go to a church and they're full of cliques, they're full of small groups, and it looks like everybody fits in, but you just don't find your group. Nobody is welcoming. Nobody offers you to go with them, set with them, go out to lunch with them, have Bible study with them, and you just feel like an outsider. That can lead to rejection. If you're passed over for ministry, if you constantly see other people promoted in ministry, being asked to share things, being asked to share their testimony, being asked to teach, what, whatever it is, but you're passed over every single time, that can lead to rejection. If you're ridiculed or shamed in the church, if you are under leadership that just browbeats you every second they can get and you feel like nothing you ever do is right, that can absolutely lead to rejection. Sorry, guys. Another one is if you have had divorce or broken relationships yourself. The divorce could, what could have led to the divorce may have been broken with trust or betrayal. And that can often lead to a feeling of rejection when the spouse just leaves you and they don't want anything to do with you. And I will put this in there. Even if you wanted the divorce and 
it was something that you was trying to get away from because there was abuse or infidelity or whatever and you wanted it, it can still lead to feelings of rejection because of it. So just because it was your choice doesn't mean you're free from rejection. You could still have a root of rejection. Another area that can open the door to rejection is abuse. That can be physical, sexual, emotional, as an adult and or a child. Any type of abuse that we suffer can lead to a root of rejection and cause us to feel rejected. Now, with rejection, many times, there is also a demon of rejection there. And I'm not saying that's its name specifically, but there is a demon connect, connected to it creating more feelings, creating more torment, creating and replaying that rejection over and over in our head. So here's usually what can happen. Let's just pick one of them. Um, let's say we were unwanted as a child. Our, our parent got pregnant with us. They didn't have a lot of money. They had their own mental illness. They had their own situation and they thought to themselves, I cannot have another child. I do not want this child. I wish I had never been pregnant. And they start speaking these things. And they're creating some word curses through the things that they're saying. And then we're born. And when we're born, that parent resents us because they didn't plan us, they didn't want us, and they don't feel like they need us. And so there's some rejection there in their actions. They're cold towards us. They take care of our needs pretty well, but they're not overly loving and they're just cold and they're distant. <clears throat> Everything about them reinforces to us that we weren't wanted, that we weren't needed, that we're not heard, that we're not really loved, and that we're a burden. That right there can open the door to the demonic and demons can come in and attach and recreate that throughout our life. So that then when we are in any situation in life, we carry those feelings of being a burden, being unwanted, being unloved. And, sorry, I just got a message I need to... And of not being of not fitting into any situation so I want to give you some symptoms and effects of rejection Proverbs 15 13 says a heart full of joy and goodness makes a cheerful face but when a heart is full of sadness the spirit is crushed rejection can make us feel like we are crushed and if you deal with rejection in any form, you probably can look at your life and see a pattern that recreates itself over and over and over. You may even get to a point where if you feel like that you are not accepted in any situation. And like is, what is that called? The snowball effect where it runs down the hill, the snowball, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It started off small, but then over the years, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and you just feel rejection in every area. It can also be the root of many other issues that you have labeled as something else. So I want to talk about signs and symptoms so we can diagnose if what you are going through is rejection. It can create deep wounds and pain that can last an entire lifetime if not dealt with. I can remember in school, this is just a small example. I can remember in school I used to get made fun of for my hair. People made fun of it being curly. And um, I used to get called, they would call it a Brillo pad. Um, it used to be way curlier than it is. Believe it or not, this is somewhat relaxed for what it used to be. Uh, we, we just didn't really know how to take care of it very well. So it, it was big. And I got tormented in school for it. So I hated my hair. Hated it. Growing up, I wanted to just shave it off because I hated it so much. I got made fun of. And the first times I can remember is in elementary school. And that stuck with me. As an adult, if someone said, oh, your hair is pretty, I would get mad. I would feel anger. And I would say, well, you can have it. I'll trade you. Or I mean, I, I would respond in anger because that root of rejection was so deep in my heart. And it seems like such a small thing. But that's how this stuff can just really get deep within us. And I can remember still thinking about those thoughts would come to my mind when they would say, I like your hair. I would think, I used to get made fun of it. I hate it. Or it reminded me of my biological dad because he had very curly hair also. And I connected that with him. And I, these things last a lifetime if we don't deal with them. We can cover them up. We can move forward. But sometimes there's a deep root that has to be dug out. So another symptom is um, 
feeling like you are unwanted, like that you just are not wanted, that you're unheard and that you're unloved by God and others. Feeling like something is just innately wrong with you, that people see faults in you and that you're never measuring up with other people, that something is always just off, something is always different and something is damaged within you. This can lead to feelings of self-rejection, self-hatred, feeling different, ugly, unloved, bad, dirty, unworthy, full of shame, full of guilt, full of condemnation. It can also lead to putting up major walls between you and other people. So you put these walls up because you've been rejected in the past and you've been hurt in the past and you tell yourself, I'm never going to get hurt again. So you put these huge walls up between you and them so you don't give somebody else the chance to hurt you. But then it causes you to not really connect with other people on a deep emotional level. It could be come from betrayal because you tell yourself, I cannot trust other people. You may create some negative inner vows. I can't trust other people, so I will never trust again. I will never let somebody hurt me again. I will never let them get that close. I will never let anybody in. If any of these sound familiar, those inner vows need to be broken. So I already kind of talked about one of the symptoms is if we have went through rejection, we can open the door to the demonic, which can allow our response to the rejection, or if there were word curses spoken over us, or if we've created inner vows, those can open doors to a demon of rejection. And it can lead to inner vows. And we can often view everybody else through the lens of that rejection. So what that looks like in real life is say you did go through divorce and it was a bad divorce and you felt rejected and unloved and then you get skewed and you're looking at the opposite sex, always thinking they're out to get you, they're going to hurt you, they're worthless, there's not a good one left out there, you'll never meet somebody else and you start viewing people through that lens and you expect them to respond the way that the other person responded towards you. And you can also view, view yourself through the lens of rejection. So you can go into a situation and because you've been rejected in the past and you carry this root of rejection, you may go into new situations expecting not to fit in, expecting not to make friends, expecting to be rejected. And it's kind of like when I was in the, the mental health field, we call it, called it a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it's kind of like what you say is going to happen will happen. And if we get in our mindset that these things will happen, it's almost like we create them by talking about them, expecting them. Like an, a person who carries a spirit of offense and is easily offended will find offense in every single situation. Because if you're looking for it, you're going to find it. And it's the same way with rejection. You may carry it so deeply and the root may be so deep, you expect it in every situation. So maybe you go from church to church to church and you say, well, I'm not accepted in any of them. I've been rejected in any of them. And possibly you haven't. It just feels like you have because when you are expecting to be rejected, you will be rejected. You don't put yourself out there. You hold yourself back and you put walls between you and the other people. So it's constant reinforcing that you are rejected, that you're separate, that you're different, that you don't fit in, that nobody's gonna accept you. The inability to receive or give love is another symptom, even from God. So you may have a wall up that's so huge that you just cannot receive love from other people. You can't see yourself through any lens other than being rejected. Whenever you accept that lie, so the lie is that you're rejected and that you can't be accepted. When you accept that lie as a truth, then you act out your life based on that lie if you accept it as truth. And that lie tells you that you can't be loved because you're not worthy of love. You can't be accepted because you're not worthy to be accepted. There's something wrong with you. And you start seeing yourself that way. So you no longer have the ability to accept love. You may look at people through paranoia and wonder what do they really want? What are they after? Because they can't possibly just want to be friends with you. They can't possibly just want to be in relationship with you. They have to have a motive. And it's because you're looking at it through the lens of being rejected and having that root. That can also go over into God. You may feel like God has rejected you in the past or because other people have rejected you that God can never accept you. You may have even been under some teaching that says that God couldn't accept you. 
Another one is aggression. Another symptom of rejection is aggression because you refuse to let anyone have the chance to hurt you, so you are constantly on the offensive. You may have started off on the defensive, and because of situations of rejection, now you are the aggressive one because you say, that's not happening again. I'm not giving anybody the chance. It's almost like you're that cactus and nobody can get close because if they do, you're going to poke them. And so you don't let people get near you. You don't let people see you. You don't let people get close to you because you're always on the offensive. We can also create a cycle of rejection that we pass on to our children. So we have to break that cycle. It often looks like this. Rejection leads to loneliness. Loneliness leads to self-pity. Self-pity leads, leads to mi misery. Misery leads to depression. Depression leads to despair or hopelessness, which can lead to suicide or death by other causes. It is a spiraling downward and it comes to nothing good. If we leave rejection in our lives unchecked, we will never walk into the identity that God has given us because we will always feel less than, we will always look at ourselves through that rejection. And we don't wanna pass that on to our children and we don't wanna parent from a place of rejection. So those are things that we have to break off our life. So in turn, they can be broken off our children. So now I wanna talk about overcoming rejection. So if you recognize that you have it, if you recognize that you have some of the symptoms and you know that you've had situations in your life that have led to rejection, how do you overcome it? Because here's the thing, were the people that rejected you right? No, we shouldn't reject each other. We shouldn't abuse each other. We shouldn't put each other through trauma. We should love each other and walk in godly kindness. But that's not the case for many of us. Many of us have been abused. Many of us have been mistreated in many different ways. So we're not saying that what people did to us was okay at all. But the thing that has to change is us. We can't change anybody else. So what we have to focus on is ourselves. How do we get this root of rejection out of us? Because if we want to be whole, we want to be healed, we want to walk in freedom, we have to get that junk all the way out. And that's what we're going to talk about now. How do we overcome rejection? Step one, recognize and acknowledge it and deal with the root. Always go after the root cause. We can spend a lifetime going after the symptoms. But if you only go after the symptoms, it's like you're only trimming the top of the tree when what you need to be going after is the root issue. That's what I always talk about. Root cause, root cause, root cause. If you don't remember anything from today, remember root cause. Go after that. Because if that is not pulled all the way out, you're not really dealing with the issue. It's kind of like the same thing in the medical field. You know, we can go to doctor after doctor after doctor, and if they just continually treat symptoms, but they never figure out why we have those symptoms and they never deal with the reason why we have them, we're not really going to get well. We're just kind of chasing our tails around and around and around. It's the same thing with these emotional issues. If we don't get to the original root cause, have it uprooted, then we're never really going to heal. Thinking, do I want to talk about this? So I think I will. Um, you know, I, for those of you that know me, you've probably heard me talk about this. I was in the mental health field for a while. That's what I went to school for. Um, got my master's. I practiced as a family therapist for a while. And for different reasons, it just was not the fit for me. Um, looking back, I know why now. But I myself, because I came from a background of having mental illness, I had been diagnosed with clinical depression, PTSD, and disassociative identity disorder. I had a traumatic childhood. My biological dad sexually abused me. He was involved in the occult. And then in my first marriage, there was domestic violence. So, you know, there was different things that, that went on that caused trauma. With all of that, I went through therapy off and on throughout many years of my life. I feel like so many times looking back, and I'm not knocking therapy. So before you say anything about that, I'm not knocking it, but let, let me get this whole thought out. Going through therapy sometimes is chasing symptoms. You're not always going after the root cause. When you deal with the root cause through prayer and with God, it can he can do in five minutes what therapy can't do in 10 years. I've experienced it myself. 
absolutely experienced it. I have helped other people walk through the process and they've experienced it. I'm not knocking therapy. It has its place. It, it can be effective for certain things. Um, I, I think that all of us at some point in our life or another probably need to go to therapy just to have somebody to talk to that is impartial. What I'm saying is, is for that deep healing we have to set with God to go after the root of these things and he has to supernaturally pull them out. He is our creator and he is our healer. He is our savior and he is our deliverer. And we have to take these things to him. I'm not looking at it in the natural because I want him in the spiritual to go in and pull those things out. And that's what I'm talking about. So step one is acknowledging it and dealing with the root cause. How we do that is ask God to show you where the rejection first entered your life. You may be able to say, oh, well, two years ago I went through a really bad marriage and a really bad divorce and rejection came in then. Don't be so quick to label that as when it came in. Set with the Lord, ask him where it first came in and see what he shows you. You may be surprised. He may show you when you were five years old, your parents spoke something over you and rejection took root that day. Ask him to show you when it very first came in, how it came in, when it came in, and where it came in the very first time. This step may be painful. He may bring things to your memory that you hadn't thought about for a while, or he may show you things that he has, you, you, you don't even know. He may show you something that you didn't even know was spoken over yourself, but he will give you the knowledge that it was spoken for the next steps. So I want you to set with him and take your time. Don't rush it, set with him. But know even if it's painful, don't stop, but keep pushing through. When he shows you exactly where it very first came in, the first time, ask him to remove the rejection and every other negative emotion connected to the rejection. Pray and ask him to totally uproot them and replace them with his healing. And then to take all of the rejection over all of the years and to pull it out of you. This sounds really simple or maybe it sounds like, what would that do? I, I, it does a lot. I have sat with people and watched. I've watched God pull things out of them that were spoken over their life when they were children and it's affected them their entire lives. And I've watched him in a moment of time uproot them, literally pull them out and replace them with his love and his healing and his acceptance. And they have then been able to walk in the full identity of God. It's powerful. After you pray that, Step two is acceptance of God's love and salvation. I want to read a few scriptures to you. Jesus took our place. Hebrews 2, 9 says, But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, by taking on the limitations of humanity, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, extended to sinners, he might experience death for the sins of everyone. He took our shame and our rejection. Hebrews 2.12 Hebrews 2 I'm sorry, Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and protect, perfecter of faith, the first incentive for our behalf and the one who brings our faith to maturity, who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and his completion of work. His shame. He took our shame. Isaiah 56, 50 verse 6 says, I turned my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out my beard. I did not hide my face from insults and spitting. And this is the last verse for a minute. Isaiah 53, 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and pain and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we did not appreciate his worth or esteem him. 
He knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what that feels like. He felt rejection. He felt our shame. He felt the pain of taking our place. Psalm 69, 20 through 21 says, Reproach and insults have broken my heart, and I am so sick. I looked for sympathy, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They, the self-righteous hypocrites also gave me gall for my food and thirst. They gave, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. When we really understand that he took our place, there was an exchange on the cross. Not only did he die for our sins and for our salvation and those things, there was an exchange. We can give him all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our humi humiliation, all of our rejection, all of those negative things that we've been through. We can give them to him and lay them at his feet because they were never ours to carry in the first place. We can lay them and pour them out and he gives us his healing, his salvation, his peace, his joy, his hope. When we fully accept his gift of salvation and his healing and deliverance, we can be released from the, the price of shame and rejection. He exchanged everything at the cross. Ephesians 1, 6 says, to the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, his son, Jesus Christ. Coming into the full understanding that he took our rejection upon himself so that we can be free and accepted by God is life-changing. If we really understood that, it wouldn't matter what people said to us. It wouldn't matter what they did toward us. We would walk in knowing who we are in him. When we have the, the full acceptance by God and we have the love of God, what can man do to us? What can man say against us? Us. What can the words of people do? Will they still hurt? Well, yeah, we're human. We're human. They're going to sting a little, but they won't take root and they won't create that, that root of rejection, that root of shame and guilt and condemnation. When we are walking in the full acceptance of our Father, like when we really get that down in our spirit, when we really understand, I only have to be accepted by God. I only have to be accepted by my Father. And if I'm accepted by him, what can anything else do to me? What can the judgment of man do to me? What can the ridicule of man do to me? What can being left out do to me? What can being hated, despised, hurt, beat, rejected, disliked? What can any of that do to me when I have the acceptance of my father? When that is all we're striving for, that things of the world don't hurt us anymore. They don't control us anymore. They don't create that root anymore. Step three is God's healing. So many times when we've had traumatic backgrounds or had things happen that created this rejection, we need healing. Start with forgiving those who have hurt you. It always starts with that. We have to forgive and release those who have hurt us. It's a must. I did a whole video just on forgiveness. If that's an area you struggle with, check it out on YouTube. What really helped me with forgiving was realizing that it is not a feeling, it is a choice. For years, I wanted to feel differently and I was waiting for the feeling. And when the Lord started walking me through the process of deliverance, he really started teaching me that forgiveness is a choice. When we choose to forgive, the feelings follow the choice, but we have to make the choice. We can't wait for the feelings to come. We have to stop keeping a running tab on hurts. We have to stop um, that inner dialogue of all of the pain that people have caused, all of the things that they've done. Every time we've been rejected, you know, it can be like a radio playing over and over in our mind or a video where we just constantly go back to, all of the times we've been rejected and we may re have them memorized. We may remember what we were wearing, what we were doing, what we were saying, how we were feeling, how they responded. Then we responded. And then we may sit and think, well, if I'd responded this way, how would it? we have to stop analyzing it? We have to let it go. We really have to stop playing it over and over in our head. When it tries to play over and over our head, we have to command it to stop in the name of Jesus. We can't live there anymore. We cannot stay in the trauma we cannot stay in the rejection we cannot stay in the pain we cannot stay in the mistreatment if we stay in that place we will never move forward we have to let it go we have to stop taking a tally of the wrongs done to us we have to lay it down 
We have to forgive and we have to be willing to move forward. We can't keep replaying it over and over and over. We have to totally release the people to God. We have to put them in his hand and leave them in his hand and really move forward in our life. We can't try to change them and we should not be playing, praying manipulative prayers for him to make them what we want them to be. We can pray for them, for him to make them what he wants them to be, but we really shouldn't be trying to make them into who we think they need to be. But we really have to release them and give them to God. Maybe they are an awful person. Maybe they've done horrendous things. That is between them and God. Justice is mine, says the Lord. That is between him and them, and you have to lay them at his feet. No, I'm not saying we don't report crime and stuff like that. We absolutely report crime and those types of things. I'm talking about releasing them and forgiving them and moving on. The next part is to ask him to remove the pain and replace it with his healing. You'll notice this is a reoccurring theme, asking him to remove and asking him to replace. Ask him to pull out every area and poison of pain and replace with his healing. Step four, you may need some deliverance. If you have dealt with rejection for years and it is a deep rooted rejection, there may be demons present that are reinforced in that rejection and you may need some deliverance. If there is a spirit of rejection after you have worked through these steps, when you get to step four, command any demon connected to the rejection to go in the name of Jesus. Working through the repentance and working through the healing is closing doors so you can verbally command them to go and release you in the name of Jesus. Don't take no for an answer. Stand your ground. This may take a while. Don't get in a hurry with this step. Command them to go, command them to release, and command them to let go of your life in the name of Jesus. Step five is our identity in Christ. We have to walk in the fruit of the Spirit and not the flesh. Do you a Bible study on the fruit of the Spirit? Write them out. Read them over your life. I will. And then name them. Walk each day choosing to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, choosing to let that be what comes out in your life. Accept who God created you to be and discover with Him who He created you to be. Ask Him, who did He create you to be? What was the purpose He created you with? Because here's what happens. God has a purpose for us and the enemy has a purpose for us. Many times, when we don't understand spiritual warfare and we don't understand identity and we don't understand walking in the things of God, the enemy comes in with his plan when we're children and he causes all of these situations to make us feel like we're worthless, we're less than, we'll never be enough, we'll never measure up. And the whole idea is to derail us from the calling of God so that we don't walk with God, we're not effective for his kingdom, we never become the people of God that we're supposed to be. When that happens, we have to peel off the lies of the enemy. Every lie that he has spoken into our identity has to be peeled off. How do we know that? Does it line up with the word of God? Do the inner voices telling you who you are, do they line up with the word of God? If the answer is no, you need to verbally rebuke them and command them to be silent. You need to replace every lie of the enemy with the truth of God. You need to get in the word. Who does he say you are? Speak that over your life. Break down every lie of the enemy. The lies of being worthless. The lies of never being enough. The lies that you don't fit in. That nobody likes you. Nobody loves you. Even God can't love you. Those are all lies from the enemy. None of those are from God. If it is negative self-talk, you will be able to stop it yourself. You will be able to stop the pattern of the negative voices by just not doing it anymore. If it's you and it's your own self and there's no outside influence, start replacing those with the truth. When the thought comes, I'm worthless, no, I'm a child of God. I have worth to my Father. If it won't be silent and it won't stop, that is demonic because we can change our own inner voice. We can pull down every lofty thought that raises above the knowledge of God. We can do that. 
if we are not able to pull it down and we're not able to silence it, it's because it's not our voice and it's somebody else talking to us. And that's the enemy. When that's the case, you need to verbally command them to be silent in the name of Jesus. You need to replace their lives with the truth found in the word of God. You need to command them to break, leave, and get out. And walking in the identity of God, whew, that is powerful. When we are walking in his identity, what other people say and do to us, I'm not going to say it doesn't hurt sometimes and it doesn't sting because of course it does, but we don't base our life on it anymore. We don't base acceptance. We don't base our worth on the acceptance of others. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if others accept us or not. We can look to the Bible and we can look at the disciples. Were they accepted and loved by everybody? No, absolutely not. Was Jesus loved and accepted by everybody? The son of God? No. People hated him. People spit on him. They beat him because of the message that he brought. So we know we're going to rub people the wrong way, especially when we're sharing the word of God. We're going to rub people the wrong way. But it's almost like an armor that you wear when you are walking in the identity of God, when you are walking in his acceptance. It, it just cannot penetrate what the other people say and do. But if we are basing our worth on other people, it will tear us apart every single time. If we are worried about how many people like us, how many people like our post on Facebook, if we are getting our worth from anything other than God, we will never feel adequate for anything because everything in life will tell us we don't measure up. The only time we will feel like we measure up is if we are getting our worth from our Father. That's it. Everything else will make us feel lack. It will make us feel less than. It will make us feel like that we will never be anything. So that is what I have on overcoming rejection. I'm going to give you guys a couple minutes, and if you have questions, I will answer those now. This was not a long one. I was able to put it together pretty good. I'm trying to keep it at an hour for you guys. Um, early on, my dad used to make fun of me because I could be on live for two, two and a half hours, and it would be nothing. I am trying to be more respectful of your time and keep it at an hour when possible. So if you guys have any questions, I will give it just a minute. And if anything comes in, I will answer them now. It's also in the, the ministry group. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, feel free to answer questions. If you're watching it on replay, feel free to answer or ask questions. And I will make sure I answer those. If you guys are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, sign up for that. And um, you can find it on Nicole Henson. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off on the ministry page. Thank you for watching.